without further ado, I'm going to launch into some questions and hopefully everyone can learn a little bit <laughs> about Miss Sally Williams. So, <clears throat> Sally, you're originally from England. What, uh, tell us a little bit about your early life there. I grew up um, in London. I was born in London. Um, I have a younger brother. Okay. Um, he's 18 months younger than I. Um, and we, obviously we both went to the same infant school. Um, we both got into the same sort of trouble. We were pretty thick as thieves, did everything together, which was great. Um, and when we were in our teens, um, our parents um, lifted us out of London and moved us lock, stock and barrel to um, the country where we had to re-find, you know, our friends, um, go to different schools and all the upheaval that 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 created, but having having said that, we um, actually, once we settled down, loved the countryside and very much still a country girl at heart, even um, even now. So, which is why I guess I live up in the Dandenong Ranges, which is a kind of a an in between. It's not city, but it's not rural, but it's in the middle. So, um, I had a great childhood. So, you know. It's um, formed the basis of who I am today, obviously, like all of us, I think, so yes. You also said you were a tomboy. Uh, very much so. I, um, especially, probably more so when I was uh, at primary school, my um, parents would constantly get phone calls from the teachers to say, um, you have to do something about your daughter, she's... <laughs> getting into, into scuffles, she's playing war games, she's mixing with the boys, she's playing football, she's not being a little girl and I think, you know, you should do something about that. But I, I didn't, my parents didn't change me, you know, I just carried on playing war games and beating the hell out of the boys <laughs> and, and um, being a better football player than they were. So. That was always that was always good, uh, and all the boys wanted me on their soccer team, so I was, <laughs> I was pretty happy about that. What were your favourite games to play with them? I was and still am a soccer tragic or football back okay. then. So I started my football career when I was just in junior school. So I would have been what eight or nine. Okay. Um, but you know. Back in the 60s, it wasn't really a, a game that girls played, so it was always very difficult to, um, to get into that in a, in a formal sense, although, as I have just said, the boys would always pick me to play on their teams because I always scored all the goals, so I guess that has to be a good thing, yes. <laughs> Do you think that at that time they understood that you were a little different there? Quite possibly deep down. I mean, I knew that I was different. Um, I knew that um, when I look back at myself now as a, a young child, I am very sure that around about the age of five or six, I was different from all the other girls at school. Um, I wasn't interested in boys as as such, other than that I wanted to be with them, to play with them, to be one of them, as opposed to, you know, look pretty for them and uh, be asked to kiss behind the bicycle sheds, which I never did. <laughs> but then I never kissed a girl behind the bicycle sheds either, so <laughs> I was a bit of a late bloomer. <laughs> well, how did you learn about homosexuality? Um, that came probably when I was, uh, started secondary school. I started reading. Um, a lot. I'd, it was a very difficult time for me because most of my information came from the dark corners of bookshops and libraries, you know, where you pick out a book and, and you look up lesbian or gay man or homosexual and it comes in, say, 
well, it's a mental illness and, you know, the, you, you need, to, you know, it needs to be treated. And it was, it was such a shock for me that that, that, that would even be um, possible. That it, it kept my lip zip for so long that, you know, A, I was scared that I had a mental illness. And then, um, again, that what would they do if they found out that that's what I was like? You know, what would they do to me? So it was very much um, for me play acting then that I was actually, you know, normal, which I never felt. I always felt completely different from all my friends. So um, I, I didn't even socialise that much with my school friends because I didn't want the pressure of, um, you know, the expectations of the boys. Oh. Because it was, it would be too hard because I wasn't interested. Were you experimenting at all with girls at this time? I wasn't. No, I no. wasn't. That didn't come until much, much later. Um, it's not to say I didn't fantasise about it and have serious crushes on my, uh, on my girlfriends. Oh. You know, it was. But I was never. Um, I was never. <sighs> strong enough, I was never brave enough to step over the line, you oh, know, okay. I, I was, I didn't want to be rejected and uh, that's always been an issue for me, rejection, so uh, I just, you know, pretended and used to deal with my dreams, you know, it was much better in my dreams because everything was perfect in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so you married a man, why did you do I that? I know, that, I mean yeah. that just smacks of you know, everything of what I have just said and against what I've said. Again, I was 23. Um, I had been sharing a house with my student nurse friends who were all coupled and eventually engaged and married. And I just thought, I've just got to do, I, you know, I can't just be the only one who's not doing this. And it, I kind of got sucked into it. There was a time where um, I actually said to my fiancé that I couldn't do it and that I wanted to um, call the engagement off and, you know, a little bit of emotional blackmail, oh, I'll kill myself if you do that. And it's like, oh, you know, when you're 23, it's like, oh, my God, I don't want to be responsible for that. And then after that, like, the whole wedding took on, it, it just took over. Like, I just felt I was on a ride. Like, everybody else did stuff. And I just was sucked along in this, this journey that um, I didn't really want to be in. And um, <laughs> this is a story that uh, I have got many... Um, many laughs out of the night before my wedding I actually spent with my bridesmaid uh, so good yes that just about paved the you know paved it all for me and the guilt was shocking but <laughs> <laughs> given that I was actually going to be walking down the aisle with my husband the following day but um I just, I had, no, I had no feelings for him uh -huh. and uh, I liked him. I didn't dislike him. He made me laugh and he was fun to be around, but I, there was nothing there. My passion was for my bridesmaid. So that made it very difficult because she was holding my dress, you mm. know, mm. and the, the, the last words she said to me before I walked down the aisle was, you look beautiful. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, when, when, oh, well, it was 1985 that I got married, so um, not that I've looked at the video for many, many years, <laughs> but uh, I don't look happy. Uh -huh. I don't look happy at all. And it's, yeah, it was, it was horrible. And if I had my time again, I would never, I'd never do it again. So, How did you meet that man? He, I met him at the wedding of a friend, of course, <laughs> and uh, his best 
his best friend actually, who was the husband of one of the student nurses that I was living with oh, and okay. was in my group of um, group of students. So yeah, it was everything, we did everything together. So mm -hmm. it just kind of, it, it just happened. You know, it just seemed like the easy thing to do, yeah. So was your coming out as a lesbian with your bridesmaid? Was that the first no, time you identified with that? it wasn't actually. I didn't come out until um, I was in Australia. And I felt that the distance between my family um, and starting a new life over here made it that much easier. I was still with my husband at the time. We came out in 1988. Uh, we separated in 1990 um, and divorced in 1992. So I actually came out to my parents in 1990. And that was difficult in itself because my, just prior to our separation, my husband and I went back to England to be with my parents. And we were already, I mean, things were already rocky. He already knew about me. Um, <coughs> And so when I came out to my parents, he did the woe is me kind of, mm. you know, woe mm. is me. Um, and that was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever done. Um, I went to bed that night and when I woke up in the morning, every single photograph that had had me in it, even from when I was a baby, disappeared. From your parents' From home? my parents' house, yeah. Oh my they gosh. just completely, it was just like I'd been completely eradicated from, um, from their life, even though I was there in front of them, which was, as you can imagine, um, particularly painful. Um, ironically, though, my mother and I went away for uh, a weekend, a long weekend following that, and um, she kind of got it mm. and she said, you know, I just, yeah, she, she got it, she knew. But she said the reason why she did what she did was because she felt that my father needed some kind of action to make it, you know, to make him feel better about my decision. So that's what she'd done. It's all very convoluted but yeah. um, by the time um, I, we were heading back to Australia the, photo, the photographs were back but uh, they didn't actually stop the pain of when I first realised that they'd all gone. So you said you were, you were both very you were both so close to the lesbian community but also mm. so far away from it. Yeah. What exactly do you mean by that? That that <coughs> brings in the whole soccer tragic thing again. I started playing soccer when I was in my teens Okay. Um, and I mean, when I look back now, I mean, it was bloody obvious that every single woman in the soccer team was a lesbian. I mean, it's, <laughs> I look back at the photographs and I think, how did I not know? <laughs> how did I not know? Um, so, yes, it, and they tried very hard to introduce me. You know, they took me out to bars and stuff and I still didn't get it. And even when one of the, um, the younger girls, her mother used to um, come and watch us play. And when I had then said, because she knew before I got married, she said, you got married? She said, you're the last person I thought would have got married. So everybody knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew, but I just pretended that I was straight and because that was easy. So, I was there, you know, <laughs> if I'd been brave enough, I, I, I would have had, you know, it would have been so much easier for me in the UK than if, if I'd just taken that step. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So. But what professions attract lesbians? What professions? Well, I have a 30-year uh, history of being a nurse and a midwife, mainly as a midwife, and certainly... Um, the caring professions, okay. I'd say. I was certainly met a lot of um, lesbians that worked as midwives, mm. um, creative, you know, art um, and tradies, 
I know, you know, a lot of tradies that are that are lesbians as well. It's kind of something that I would have liked to have done, but yep, I'm not very good at you know hammering in nails or <laughs> building fences. I like to think I am, but <laughs> not really. Um, so yes, I guess, yeah. You mentioned the Association of Radical Midwives. What, what was that? When I was a student, I was always a little rebellious. Um, well, just as a, in general, it was rebellious. Uh, the Association of Radical Midwives is, um, was very much in its infancy when I first started midwifery and has grown into um, an international um, organisation now. And it's... Um, Midwives and student midwives that are committed to improving maternity services in the UK and internationally. Um, they have a, a strong belief in, in uh, that all women should have the right to a, a service that's tailored to their needs, not, not a one-size-fits-all um, service, which tends to be very much the case. Hmm even now, especially over here, and I think probably in America as well. Um, and for their, the, their birth attendants to be sympathetic to their needs and not just railroad them into um, decisions that you know, they'll ultimately regret later, because obviously it's hugely emotionally packed um, time of their lives. And if you don't have somebody who can talk you through um, your experience, of course you're going to say yes to the epidural, you're going to say yes to whatever drugs you can be, that can be thrown at you. Which is why when I came over to Australia I became um, a privately practising midwife, so I was with women who had home births and um, yeah, of course that took the rebellion a little bit further and was not the favourite of uh, hospital midwives and and doctors specifically, so because I was out there on a limb helping women do something that they would rather that they didn't. What brought you to being a midwife? I can't actually remember specifically other than I always thought that I would be a midwife. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I can remember talking at school about it, oh, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up type of thing, I want to be a midwife. It's like nobody knew what a midwife was. What's a midwife? <laughs> it's like, oh, just somebody who helps women have babies. It's like, oh, that's a funny job. But it's, it's like I said, I've been, I spent 30 odd years doing it and it, it was a roller coaster of emotions. I, I mean, I loved it. I, know I have been a midwife in all sorts of places. So I've been a midwife in tertiary institutions, I've been a midwife in public, private, small hospitals in outback Queensland where you're the only midwife on and you have to deal with whatever comes through the door, um, home births, you name it. So it's the experience is kind of um, yeah, it's been an amazing experience. I've just, I had to pull, I had to pull the pin about seven years ago because it was just too much, like uh, politics. But um, the fact that maternity services are not getting anywhere, we're still fighting the same fights now as we were. Um, you know, well, what what are started. those fights? What are you fighting? Um, just allowing women to make their own choice about how they have their baby, rather than you you know the doctor's stating this is what you will do um and that's how you're going to have your baby without actually listening to what the women really want um and my my partner now is also a midwife and she has the same issues she's always you know locking horns with the medical profession about um you know what women need or what women want or what they perceive women need or what they tell women like women often don't get a choice mm -hmm. so and that, that's a that's the big thing is just allowing women to have their own voice around having their you know around having their babies rather being told what you're going to do 
But you mentioned emotions in this. What kinds of emotions did you have? Um, oh, look, there's the, the highs, the lows, obviously, you know, not all women end up with a live baby, um, dealing with the, the heartbreak, sharing that with, um, sharing that with the family, um, all those women that have live babies that don't survive for whatever reason. Mm. So you have the highs of the baby being born and then, you know, the angst while the child, you know, the baby is unwell and then the decisions that they have to make around that and supporting the family through that. So, um, and supporting colleagues in the same, you know, in the same instance, so, yeah. What do you feel was your greatest accomplishment as a midwife? Um, I think probably working as uh, a midwife in Outback Queensland. Um, just women, are, country women are different. I don't know if anybody else is, you know, aware of that, but they, they just, they're strong, you know, they see their animals give birth, you know, they come in and they get on with it and they expect it to be painful, they expect it to be hard. Um, and working with women who are so in tune with their bodies is like a breath of fresh air. Um, so when I came back to, came up to the big smoke and started working with women who were like, oh, I'm dying. So, <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> You're not going to die. Believe me, you're not going to die. It's <laughs> like, wow. They're so, I mean, deep down inside of me, I just want to go, mm. toughen up, princess. Like, <laughs> you're having a baby. Yeah, but, and then, you know, those women that say, oh, two days after the baby's born, I really need some adult time. It's like, wow this child is going to really struggle. If you, mm. if you can't handle one child after 48 hours, it's going to be tough for you. Yeah, it's, um, so give me the Outback women over inner city women having babies any day. Wow, <laughs> wow. That's a very strong statement. Yeah. Very it's strong true. statement. Yeah. So if, is there anything about that that uh, you wish were more commonplace in the, in the modern society, modern hospitals? Oh, I think it's, it, it's, I mean, yes, I would, it, it's a really, that's a really hard question to answer because s so many women just hand over the, right, okay, you're the doctor, you're the midwife, hmm. just do, you know, I'll do whatever you tell me to. And it's, I find that really hard. So it's, I don't know whether, I mean, I haven't, I haven't been inside a hospital to help, you know, to be with a woman having a baby for probably eight or nine years now. So I, I'm sure things are slightly different, but, but I know the difference between the women that I looked after as a student in the late, mid to late eighties to the women that are coming through having babies now, are just the, different and I, I don't I don't know why I don't know how hmm. that works I don't know what it is about you know modern women that make them um, make them different around childbirth it's um, yeah it, it's frustrating and sad yeah how did you train to be a midwife I uh, did. Hosp I was hospital trained, as I was um, um, with my general. So we, we. But so I guess it's almost like an apprenticeship, really. I mean, you you start your course and you work. Okay. Um, so you know you're thrown in the deep end right from the first day, and then we did. I think I think we had one day a week where we had lectures and. Um, yes, but we. I just learned on the job and uh, we had some amazing midwives that, that, um, that I worked with. 
well, that we all work with, actually, and I learned so much from them that uh, that sort of carried me through to where I was, you know, when I finished. Okay. On a slightly lighter note, you said that you have uh, a habit of swaying straight women <laughs> into relationships with you. So how yep. do you do this? What <laughs> do I do that? You know. Yeah, I was thinking about that on the way in, you know, I've always wondered that. I've, I've never... I've never really had a relationship with an out-and-out -out lesbian. <laughs> um, and I'm not quite sure why that is. So, I don't know whether it's that, you know, the whole forbidden fr fruit thing, you know, the challenge. Um, but I loved it. And so did they. So, I mean, <laughs> can't really complain. <laughs> uh, all my long-term relationships have been ostensibly straight women who have then either come, you know, we've either lived together or, you know, lived apart but spent a lot of time together. Um, and it was always the, the thrill of the, the thrill of the chase. And... Pushing them gently um, until they just went, I oh, can't, yeah, let's do it. And then, you know, that first time, that, that thrill, you know, when you can see that they're like, oh my God, what am I doing? But then just having an amazing experience. And then they just come back for more. I mean, what else can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but how do you know whom to approach or how to go about well, this? I, well, there's definitely a chemistry. I mean, I don't, I just don't go willy nilly because you know I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably get locked up. I mean, I often think about you know, probably now, I sometimes almost bordering harassment when I look back at it now you know I think I would never do that now um, I was never I never did anything that wasn't consensual though I mean if somebody said not interested um, you know I'm kind of like that you fancy me but I'm not interested it's like okay then you know thanks thanks for letting me know or I pursued this any further um, but yeah, it's, I don't know, I don't know, I still can't, I really still can't explain it now even to <laughs> myself, so um, yeah, it's, it, it, and I don't know what it is about, you know, overtly out lesbians that make me think that. I don't know whether it's just because it might be a little bit I don't know whether it's more to do with power or difference or just trying to win somebody over, you know, get them to bat for the other team. Come and jump. <laughs> Come over, the grass is greener, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. do you, how many people do you think you've been able to sway over? <laughs> oh goodness, um, probably about nine or ten. Okay. So, yeah, um, out of that lot, though, one five of them, I five women that have been in relatively long-term relationships, two long-term relationships. So, um, my partner prior to uh, my partner now we were together for 14 years and now my current partner I've been with for um, well we met in 2006 it was a fairly rocky start everybody thought you know we shouldn't be together but we would shout and scream at one another and leave and come back and leave and come back but we've actually been living together now and have been building a house for the last five years so we've been living together for about seven and um we're in a yeah we don't shout the screen very often now so that's good yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> you did say you were a serial monogamist, so is that uh, yes. what you're depicting for me? Yeah, here? that's that. Well, that, that that follows on from that actually. If if I got a little bit jaded or I was feeling that things weren't going anywhere, um, <coughs> there'd never be much break in between partners, and often there would be overlapping a period of overlap before, you know, one relationship would end and I would jump into another. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about that again on the way in. I made a little note, actually. Uh, probably my in in inability to cope with being alone, but now I actually crave being alone. Like, I would... If... I've come to the point now that if this relationship didn't work, which, I mean... It, it won't not work, I would be very happy to be on my own. I'm very happy in my own company now. Um, and probably more so at the moment because my current partner's daughter and two grandchildren are living with us. Um, oh, okay. So we, we have a nearly five-year-old and nearly three-year-old um, with us four nights. Four, so we're four nights on, four nights off. So you know, lots of hideous family court shit going on. Oh, boy. So I just can't cope with that. It's just like too much noise. <laughs> they, call um, this, well, they call me Mima, which is lovely, and they're beautiful kids, absolutely beautiful kids. And on the side note to that, I have to say, my, they're my grandchildren as well, really, obviously. Oliver, who is nearly five, still cannot grasp the fact that I'm a woman. He was absolutely dead certain that I was a man. <laughs> like, but no, he was like, no, Mima's a girl. No, no, no Mima's a man. What? No, Mima has a vagina. No, <laughs> no. So we're just kind of cruising along on that one. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how we're going to broach that when he's a little bit older. Oh, we've never said that, that's his that's his take on it. I mean, his his father's never said that I'm a man. His other grandparents have never said that I'm a man. That's just who he identifies me as. Oh. So, and because I'm pretty certain that you know when when you're in a relationship and Nan's obviously a woman, then of course I must be a man, because how do you, how do you explain it otherwise? So we haven't quite had that conversation yet. We're not sure he's quite ready for it, but he knows, you know, ostensibly I'm a woman, but am I? <laughs> <laughs> do you have children of your own? No, I don't. Oh, okay. I, never, I never ever wanted children. Right from when I was small, I have, however, a collection of other people's children. My previous partner had five. So <coughs> really, I have eight uh, stepchildren and two grandchildren, although some of my ex my ex-partner's children have children, but I don't actually have anything to do with those little ones so um yeah it's a lot of children for somebody who didn't want children <laughs> <laughs> taking a step back though i can't help but wonder when you were with your husband were you experimenting out with women or did you just put up with a very oppressive situation i did experiment my bridesmaid was an ongoing relationship during okay. our marriage um, until obviously um, we moved to Australia. Um, she was the only young woman that I experimented with. Um, I, we didn't live anywhere where I knew anybody that would want to. So, but yes, it was pretty oppressive. It was pretty oppressive and I would often, and I hope this doesn't um, trigger anybody, uh, would often drive home from work, say often, probably every day, 
I wonder what would happen if I drove into this tree. Mm. So it was, it, from a mental health perspective, it was tough. Yeah. Because I, I was just in a situation that I didn't want to be in. And for my thoughts then, it would be easier just not to be around. Obviously, I didn't follow through with it, thankfully. Mm. Yeah. How did your husband react when you came out with this? He hoped upon hope that I was bisexual and that, you know, he would still be able to be with me, but, but I just said to him, that's not going to work, I can't, that, that's just not going to work. So it, it became fairly acrimonious and I don't blame him, I, I broke his heart um, and I did treat him pretty badly. Mm. Um, but. I was just being true to myself and sometimes when, you, when you're true to yourself, people around you get hurt and yeah. it's not something that I'm proud of, but it's something that I had to do. Yeah. How were you introduced to BDSM? My ex-partner actually was probably more of the uh, adventurous, she, well she didn't push me into it, but she was really um, curious. We had, she introduced me to a friend who then actually became a mutual friend. And we used to, oh, we used to play out scenes at our friend's house. She was um, in a three-way relationship. So the five of us used to go to her place. Um, and she, I always remember there was, a, a, Jo used to, there was a saying, she said, if you can't do it in your fluffy slippers and your dressing gown, you can't do it wearing leather. And it always used to make me think that's really, wow. So, you know, often we wouldn't be dressed up, we'd be in our PJs, you know. Um, okay. And it didn't actually detract from the experience, just made it different, that's all. And then Steamworks used to put on a, um, a women's night. And I guess that's when I really saw what was out there. <laughs> you know, it was, wow. It was, I loved it. It was just amazing. You know, we used to try everything that was there, the slings, the, um, the cages. Uh, oh, wow, it's just, I so wish that that was still open. We had so much fun. Um, and then even after Steamworks closed down, Wet on Wellington used to do a monthly for women, but it was never, was never the same. It never had the same vibe there. Oh, okay. um, and I don't know, it was, wasn't well attended. So you didn't get the same, you didn't get the same atmosphere. It was like walking into a half filled pub, you know, and everybody's just kind of having their own conversation and it's like, oh, this is a bit boring, let's go home. But if you really didn't know anything about uh, the lesbian community prior to really discovering that, mm. how did you have any concept on BDSM? Um, I'm not quite sure to be quite honest with you. I think it's, okay. as I said, my, um, my ex was very curious, so she really opened up the whole world of Okay. of BDSM and we kind of I did a lot of reading a lot of and, and just a lot of experimenting with each other like that's that's how it started okay. and I never played apart from apart from Joe um, I never played with anybody outside of my relationship uh, from a BDSM point of view we were very much you know a, a close couple in in that sense so I wouldn't mind watching other people. <laughs> I used to love watching other people. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't participate with people that I didn't know or didn't have a connection with. So, um, and when I was younger, I was actually quite shy. So it's really difficult to, um, you know, get out there. So I used to, I guess in some respects, used to hide behind my gear because, you know, pull the cap down so that you don't just see your eyes. And you can kind of, you know, okay, yeah, cruise the room. Mm, mm. And people don't actually know what's going on underneath. 
So it was, it was, it was a protection as well for me. Okay. So yeah. But speaking of what you, you call a cap, we call a cover on the other mm -hmm. side of the ocean. And I, tell us about that. Why are you wearing that? It was one of the things that, um, it was a discussion between my partner and I. So there was no special um, like ceremony or um, challenge or, you know, anything like that that made me, like I didn't earn a cap. Okay. Um, likewise, she didn't earn her collar. But I collared her and I wore the cap. So it was more to do with our partnership than anything to do um, outside of outside of that. So because we um, initially were just playing with one another, <coughs> it didn't it didn't matter what other people thought. You know, I mean, I was just out there. I wore my cap. She was out there. She wore her collar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. What do you most enjoy about SM activity? One of the things that I really enjoyed was um, depriving someone of like, like sensory deprivation. Mm. So blindfold. Uh, one of the things my these boots particularly make a loud noise on floorboards. So if I was to blindfold my then partner and walk on the floorboards, that's base almost all I had to do for her. And she would be like, oh, you know, <laughs> it was it was the boots and the noise and the anticipation of what was coming next without actually knowing what was coming next. I that's that was really my should I say my game plan. That's <laughs> what that's what we did a lot of. Yeah. Tell us about being Ms. Melbourne Leather 1995. Tell us about that. I don't know. <laughs> it was one of those weird things. Like, I think, I don't even know how, it just happened. Like, it was, um, I can't even remember how we even became competitors. Like, <coughs> I think my then partner, I just said something to me, oh, there's a competition coming up, let's, let's enter. I said, well, what, what is it? I don't know, well, I know, I think Miss, Wick, uh, Miss Wicked had died of death, is that right? Um, and I don't know, just this other competition came into being, I can't even remember how long it, it, it actually went on for, I think probably only two or three years, three years, yeah. And all I can remember, we weren't, there was not to be any sexual penetration, supposedly no blood play or breaking of skin. Um, you had to show, there has to be some kind of artistic content. Um, and, oh gosh, what was the other thing? Oh, uh, to um, show safe sex, basically. Oh, oh. So we... But, and this is where my partner came then was, she was amazing. She was like the artistic director of the, the performance that we did. Right, it took us ages and ages of practice to get it right. Mm. And <coughs> just, I remember the, the, I think Carl, you were on before us, weren't you? Yeah. So I remember watching Carl thinking, oh goodness, I'm getting a bit hot here. This is really, <laughs> I don't know how I can follow that. But um, going up on stage in front of all these people that, I mean, there were, you know, a smattering of people out there that I knew. And then doing this performance, uh, there's just the, the music that we used was um, Enigma's Mea Culpa. And now whenever that plays, I'm trans transported yeah. straight back to that stage, you know, and oh, God, it was... Pretty certain that there was a fairly thunderous round of applause afterwards. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, well, what did we just do? 
And then there were other performers on after that and just the whole night kind of went in a bit of a whirl. And then when they called out the winners, obviously Carl was, you know, the winner of Mr Melbourne Leather, and then they called out my name. And I'm thinking, no, this can't be right. <laughs> this can't be right. <laughs> and I got so wrapped up in the, in, in the celebrations and the photographs and the, and the putting on of the sash and that I completely forgot about my partner. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it was oh. like, how bad is that? Like, and I just, even now, I just this pang of guilt that she wasn't up on stage with me. Like, what kind of top mm. does that to their submissive? Like, it was not good. It, it didn't come up in our relationship for some time, but as stuff started to get antsy and not mm. good, I would get that thrown back at me. Oh. And yeah, I mean, I still, I still very, still feel a lot of guilt around that. But having said that, the whole God, it was just the most amazing night. But it was just a night. Like, I don't think anything, it's not like the competitions today where people, you know, there's like charities and oh, raising yeah. money yeah. and it was just a night. I don't think I, apart from going back the next year to judge the competitors for the next uh, Mr and Miss Melbourne Leather, I don't think, there was nothing, you know, it was, I had the sash, I was Miss Melbourne Leather, 1995, and Clearly, that's still, you know, people still remember that. But mm. sometimes I think, really, <laughs> sometimes I feel a bit of a fraud. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about you? That I'm scary and unapproachable. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> that's right. And often, uh, yeah, people think that, and I think I portray that sometimes. If I don't want to talk to somebody then I'll put up the barriers. But if I think, hey, you know, I think I'd really like to get to know you, then my closest friends will laugh at that. They just said, no, you're just a marshmallow. <laughs> Scratch the surface and you're all soft and gooey underneath. Yeah. So I think that about sums me up. <laughs> Sally Williams, thank you for participating thank you and very being much part of the Fireside Fair. Thank you. <laughs>